Uh, okay. A any questions before I begin? Um, so basically, there are only two more things left uh, for the material for the exam. Today, I have to give you a little bit more of the theory related to like the syntax of linear equations. Um, and then next time, I'll tell you like how to find the inverse of a matrix, well, assuming that inverse, like, the inverse exists. Uh, so those are basically the last two things that I've left. And then, as I said, um, next one, they will do is some sort of review session. Uh, Okay, so before uh, giving you some more, uh, some of the theory related to this sense of equations, let me do like uh, um, one more example. So last time I gave you an example of like where the system had infinitely many solutions. Another example where there was a unique solution. So the last one left is just uh, one where there's like no solutions. So that you get like a, a sense of how that looks like. So, um, and after that, I'll tell you, I'll give you some definitions. So imagine I give you this system, um, x plus y plus three z equals nine, then two x minus y plus z equals eight, and then three x, Minus okay, so uh, again, the idea with all these systems is that we just uh, turn it into a matrix. So this becomes one, two, three. Two negative one one three zero zero negative one and it's augmented with the constants um, or the numbers that, uh, on the right on the right hand side of the equation. Sorry, nine eight three. Uh, okay, and as usual as last time in case. Um, to try to make this matrix as close as possible at the identity. Uh, the name for that is, try, is to find the reduced echelon form of the matrix, which I'll define for you in a second, but like that's essentially what it means. I just want, you just want to make as many zeros as possible after you put like a one on each column uh, if, in, the, in the ideal case. So this already starts like the identity, right? There's like a one here. So the next step is just to make a zero here and a zero here, right? So for example, uh, to make a zero here, you can do it like minus two times row one, add it to row two. So minus two times row one, add that to row two and substitute that into row two. So that's kind of usually how we will write that operation. And then uh, to put a zero here, you can do minus three times row one, add it to row three. And again, uh, substitute that in, in the third row. And since like these operations, these substitutions are happening on separate rows, then it's fine to do the two of them at the same simultaneously. That just saves you a little bit of space and time. Is that okay? Um, so like, because it would be ambiguous, so what I'm trying to say is kind of ambiguous if you said, well, and in addition to this, I'll multiply root two by five, right? Because then you are like, well, what are you going to do first? Are you going to do the subtraction like of the rows and then multiply by five or are you multiply by five first and then doing this thing with the rows? So as long as like the operations don't interfere with one another, you can do them like simultaneously. So, Nothing is happening to row one. So you get one, two, three, nine. And then what happens with row two? Well, this becomes negative two with this two is zero. Then uh, negative two, two is negative four. And negative four with negative one is negative five. And then negative two, three, negative six. 
negative six with one is negative five also. And then this one gives you negative 18. Negative 18 with eight is negative 10. And then, um, so negative three with three is zero. Negative six with zero is negative six. Negative nine with negative one is negative 10. And then uh, negative 27 with three is negative uh, 24. Oh, I think this is, no, this is, uh, this was starting to look very familiar. Um, because this is actually the one we had done before with the unique solution. Sorry, so let me fix this one. Uh, I mean, it is fine, but this was done last time. So let's ignore it. I mean, if still someone wants to copy it, this was the unique unique case. So the one that I sorry about that. The one I wanted to do was this system. I suppose I mean I could try to fix that, but uh, I mean it was better to. And now uh, we should be fine. Okay, so when you turn this one into a matrix, you get one, two, three, four, five, one, three, five, seven, eleven, and then um, one, negative one, negative two, negative six. Okay, so let's, yeah. So it is, I mean, it starts very similar to, to the one that I was just doing. Um, because the, there's like a one in the first entry, so uh, it's a little bit easier. You just have to do minus row one, row two, row two, and then minus row one into row three. And and if you do that, you get one, two, three, four, five, and then uh, zero. Negative two with three is negative. Uh, sorry, negative two with three is one. Negative three with five is two. Negative four with seven is uh, three. Negative five with 11 is six. So here you get zero, then you get negative two, uh, then negative three with negative one is negative four, and then negative four with negative two is negative six, and then um, negative five with negative six, negative 11. That making sense. Um, uh, so far, so good. Questions about this. And again, uh, this we're trying to get this as close as possible to the identity. So the first column looks like the column of an identity matrix, like a one and a bunch of zeros. This one already has a one here. So the goal would be to make this a zero and this a zero, right? So how do you make that? Uh, those things happen. So to put a zero. In here, you could do minus two times row two into row one and substitute that into row one. And to put um, 
and see rows in here, you can do two times row two into uh, add it to row three and substitute that to row three. Uh, so let's see what happens when you do that. Uh, nothing is affecting row two, so that's the one that is now left the same. And uh, now you have zero with one is one. Negative two with two is zero. Negative four with three is negative one. Negative three, I'm sorry, negative six. Yeah, negative six with four is negative two. Negative 12 with five is negative seven. And um, here is zero. It is two with negative two is zero. Four with um, negative four um, is zero. Six with negative six is zero. And then 12 with negative 11 is zero. Okay, so, uh, well, let me give you a second to copy this. Uh, uh, is that uh, so the first thing you realize is that there's a lot of operations that you have to be doing in your head, right? Because there's a lot of multiplications and additions. So it's not that e either of that, e each one individually, it's not that they are difficult, right? But it's still like, if you just, if you, especially if you're just doing it in your head, like it is easy to just make a mistake, right? Because there are just so many that you are doing, like. Like and like for any given matrix reducing it, which is what the name of what we're doing, like could involve like 20, 30, 40 operations, right? That you're doing constantly. So um, that's like a little something where you have to be careful in practice. Like, you know, it is better just to double check each step to make sure that you didn't do a typo because sometimes the typo is like a, like a domino, like it does kind of ruin everything dramatically. Uh, from saying that a system has no solutions to saying that it has infinitely many solutions to saying that it has a unique solution. So like it can become very sensitive if you just make a mistake. But assuming that this is fine, uh, can there, anyone detect the problems that we have? Yeah. yeah. Right, like the third row is like the problematic one. Because if you were to reinterpret that in terms of like the variables, right? The third row is saying that zero X plus zero Y plus zero Z plus zero W equals one, which is like the same as saying that zero equals one and that cannot happen, right? So this is the problem. So here's a, like it can't happen. And so this is telling you that this system has no solutions, right? because you quickly get to a contradiction. So no solutions. And essentially that's kind of like how all of the systems without solutions look like. After you reduce them a little bit, you'll get to a row. It may not have appeared like at the bottom, right? Like, but one of the rows in your system will read like a bunch of zeros equals a non-zero number. Right, and then and then you're done. Yeah. Well, in this case, no, because uh, the matrix was three times four. I mean, like invertible is kind of like a notion that we're just given to, you know, to square matrices, but it had nothing to do with the fact that um, it was not. I mean, it had nothing to do with invertibility. I mean, it is true that if um. It is true that if the matrix is invertible, then there's always um, a solution. Uh, but that's something you can only discuss when the the system has uh, the same number of like equations as variables, if, if that makes sense. So this is completely um, 
you know, separate from like the invertibility because here like the in, um, invertibility uh, didn't uh, make sense. Like the, you know, what is uh, this is saying, like there's, uh, uh, let's think about it. I can different way to think about this. Um, I, I, I think it's uh, kind of like the question that I had been asked like last time, if you thought of this like, or we, like this would represent some sort of hyperplanes or whatever, right? So geometrically what's happening is like these two could be meeting, right? And these two uh, are also meeting, but there's nothing that meets them simultaneously, right? Like, so there's like, um, so that's like a more geometric way to think about it, but yeah, like the invertibility is not, it's not like uh, something that uh, comes up uh, here because, um, because uh, the system was not a square one, but it is true. I'll I'll write that in a couple of minutes. It is true that if your matrix is invertible, then there's always a solution to the system, a unique solution. In fact, uh, we can write it down. Um, but is that making sense? So like the idea is like the warning is like the moment you. I mean, inconsistent systems are kind of easy to to identify. You will always get a you will always get like bunch of zeros before this vertical line followed equal set equal to like a non-zero constant. That's kind of like how they always look like. So detecting them is easy them as, long, as long as you know that you didn't make a typo, right? Because imagine if you, again, like you're doing all this arithmetic and you just put like a zero here by mistake instead of a one. And if you put a zero by mistake, they, they're actually, you would say that this system has infinite solutions, right? Because like now this is just saying zero x, zero y, zero w, zero or zero z equals zero. That's fine. Like that's a useless equation. You throw it out. And so you just get like two interesting equations that you work with. And then you would say this is just had infinitely many solutions. So that's what I mean uh, when I say that uh, the the answer is sensitive to not having many mistakes because you can jump from saying that it has zero solutions to infinitely many, right? Um, is that okay? Yeah, so let me start summarizing a little bit of what we have been doing uh, for uh, today. And next time I'll tell you this thing about how to find the inverse of the, uh, of the matrix. I mean, uh, I started with the examples just to give you a sense that in practice, once you have seen a little, a few of them, you kind of get like a, a, an idea of what you're supposed to do all the time. If, if you like programming, you can actually try to like set up a computer program, right? That would reduce this for you. Like you could like have like a variable that just looks like at the not at the column, right? At a given column on the matrix. And then you are like, well, you start with the first column, you find the first entry on, along this column, which is not a zero, right? You move it to the top, you turn it into a one, use that one to kill everything else in that column, and then you move to the next column and kind of iterate the process. Uh, so, like, I mean, it is very computational. It is an algorithm, what you would call like an algorithm, or it's like a very mechanical thing. So, um, this, like, what we're doing is um, uh, finding the row reduce echelon form of the matrix. So, let me. Um, just give you that definition so that you have it around. But again, like in practice, it's like you don't really need to know the definition, like because like you just start trying to make it look as much as possible as identity matrix, and that's essentially that. So the, there were like, um, the idea is like you had like a system of equations. So you have a system of equations. Which we write as AX equals B, right? And there are like three operations that we were doing. The three operations were like swapping or interchanging rows that's allowed, 
right? So there are like three operations you can use. Um, the first one is like um, interchanging rows. The second one is like multiplying a row by a non-zero, multiplying or dividing a row, like however you want to, to say it. Multiplying or dividing a row by a non-zero number, right? A non-zero scalar. And the last thing we were doing, which is kind of like, um, like this tour, like, well, this one's kind of boring. Uh, it's just to like move them around like the, the equations or the rows. The second one is also a very natural thing to do uh, to get a, a one uh, on one of the answers that you care about. And then the one that's a little bit more interesting was this one, like of combining the rows, right? So you can add rows um, or add one row times like a, do like a scalar times row, let me write it like that, times a row plus another row, right? So this, this is like some sort of like addition of rows, or like, like adding rows. So the idea is like you started with this augmented matrix, like you do your operations, like this. Uh, op uh, these are called elementary operations. Like so, you do these like operations, like you apply these operations. Until you get to a new matrix, which we're, which we're calling R for row uh, reduce or uh, the row echelon form of the matrix. And like, I mean, as you apply these operations, like you're also mod modifying, you know, this right hand side. So like you're going to get uh, to some new vector. But like the idea is that you have to reach a point where um, like you stop until the uh, the matrix that you see on the on the left hand side has like a particular form. So you stop um, doing this until the matrix R has the following. Uh, once the matrix R has the following property. And again, I'm just describing in a lot of words what we were doing. So it's not something that, I mean, practice, you always kind of know what to do, but I'm just trying to at least uh, write it out more explicitly. So like the, what you're looking is for this matrix to have the following that every row every row with non zero entries appears above um, above the rows with zero entries. So like the stuff that has a bunch of zeros, they should uh, they're kind of sent to the bottom. Like you like everything that has zero 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 zero. There's nothing interesting about them. Like they just they're just placed at the bottom. Uh, that actually happens again naturally once you start trying to make this like look as much as the identity. So again, in practice, not um, 
something to worry too much about. And then, um, the leading, the first entry or the leading entry of each row is one. The leading uh, entry of each non zero of each uh, non zero row is one. And then there are two more conditions. Uh, when a column has a leading entry of some row, all other all other entries in that column are zero. All other entries in that column are zero. And the last one is that, um, let's see. The least. Okay, yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> they're kind of like long to write, but um, let me put it here. The leading entry. Uh, in a column to the right of the column in the leading venture of the preceding book. Of the preceding So that's like a very uh, long way of saying that, again, we're trying to just get this matrix to look as much as possible at the event. So it's like, it's not like a definition that you really have to be worried about in like for practical purposes, because it's just doing what we were doing. But that's kind of like, you know, if you were uh, trying to explain all the conditions to someone, that's kind of like what that would entail. Like it's like, you know, if you want to write it down explicitly as some sort of like, properties that you will look this matrix to have. Um, that's essentially what it's saying. Like, If something had a bunch of zeros, it goes to the bottom. Uh, if a column has like uh, a non-zero entry, you know, I mean, you make the, on each row, you make the first non-zero entry one, which is what you see here. And then you kind of, once you have a one, you make uh, all the, uh, on that given column, you make every everything else like a zero. It's essentially what we were doing but just write written down explicitly. Okay, so it's not, again, like, uh, then a definition that I would say you have to worry, worry about, but it's like, um, it just summarizes what we were doing. So, The important thing is more like that. There are only three things that you're allowed to do, which is it is interchanging rows, multiplying a row by a number, or dividing a row by a number, and adding rows together. So like all of these like solving of systems of linear equations, like 
requires you just to do like one of those, like those three things. And you cannot do anything else because if you do something else, then you may affect the solutions of the system. So these are like operations that guarantee uh, preserving the solutions of a system of equations. Okay, so now what I was going to do is um, tell you something more useful about how do you identify um, whether a system would have like zero solutions, infinite solutions, or a unique solution. So that's more act that's more useful than this. So for that, we need to talk about the rank of a matrix. Okay, which is actually a very important concept. And then I'll let you do So here A is going to be an M by N, M by N matrix. Okay. And the idea to what's the rank of the matrix? Well, you reduce the matrix A like using these operations, like these uh, basic operations, until you get to like again as um something as close to the identity, which is this matrix R. So you uh, apply these operations, right? so you reduce the matrix A. Until using the base, like the three previous operations. <laughs> Until um, you get the matrix R, you get to the reduce um, to the uh, reduced matrix to the Okay. So the idea is that the rank of A just the number of non-zero rows of R I'm about to give you some examples uh, and the nullity of A is the number of columns of A minus the rank.
Okay, so this is one of the most important, uh, we'll do a lot of, about this um, for the second midterm, use this a lot, like the rank and the, the nullity, but for now, uh, the idea is that you can use that to like describe in a more systematic way, um, you know, when a system has solutions and when it does not and when uh, it has a unique solution. So let me give you some examples of what I mean by this. So. So let me give you some examples. The first one is the following. So let's say that the matrix A had been this thing. And this is a vector B. Where have we, uh, does um, maybe this entry so familiar? Or did we leave? Uh, right, it's a, the example that I, well, not the first one that I did because the first one I did, I had started once uh, we had already done, but the one that we worked out earlier today had precisely these entries. So when we reduce this, right? When we reduce this, we got we got one, zero, negative one, negative two, right? Zero, one, two, three, zero, 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 one. Okay. That's like what you got what you get after reducing this this. So this is what I'm calling R. And let's call this uh, B new because it's a, a, a new vector, right? I should use, uh, well, let me put this. Right, the R. So A is always like the matrix you start with, and R is like the version of A that's closest to the identity after you apply these basic operations. Okay, so the idea is that the rank of A, that the rank of A cannot be read off directly from the matrix itself that you start with. You have to simplify it first. And once you get to this simplified version, like to find the rank, you just have to count the number of rows which are non-zero. And by non-zero, I mean that at least one of their entries is not zero, right? So this one has a non-zero row, right? This one has a non-zero row, but like if if you just look at uh at the last one, you have zero, 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 right? So there's like only two non-zero rows. So the rank of A in this case is That making sense because there's a number of non zero rows of R. Yeah, 
that the first two entries would be the Oh, oh, you mean that? Uh, oh, did I do copy? I mean, it's still true, right? Uh, let's see. Oh, is that I cannot? Right, 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 right. I think I know what you're saying. Um, uh, give me a second. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that right, right? Like the, this one's like a negative six, negative seven and negative six. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Oh, right, right, right. No. Yeah, yeah. That's fine. I mean, good. Thanks. Thank you, thank you. Everything else is fine. <laughs> yeah, it's still, uh, I mean, right, like still the correct uh, interpretation and everything, but, um, but yeah, thanks for pointing that out. The thing what happened is that in the, on the PDF, you can use as an extra step, the one from this third row to kill this first two entries if you want, but it's not needed. Uh, yeah, yeah, like, so this is fine, like how it, either it would have been fine, but now it looks a bit, thanks. Okay, so the rank of A is two, because again, there are two non-zero rows, right? But now what is the rank, right? What is the rank of the matrix that represents A together with this vector B, right? Like if you forget about this like vertical line, this is kind of like a matrix it's on its own, right? It would be like, what, like a three times five matrix, so. So like essentially what I'm asking now is for the rank of not just like the, the, the matrix we can care about first, but like if like the one that you would get if you included like the this other one as a uh, this vector as a column for this one. What would that the rank be? Yeah. It would be three because if you forget, like, just imagine you did it for a moment, like this vertical line. If you delete that for a moment, uh, then now there's like an, another non-zero row, right? Like this one has like a one, which is non-zero, right? So in this case, like this one has three. Because now we include the, the entries of B, right? Since now we include we consider the entries of B. Okay. And so uh, one way to say that this is, I mean, like maybe it looks a little bit of an overkill, but um, because it's kind of clear here that it has no solutions. But one way to say that a system has no solutions is like if these two ranks are different. Okay, so let me write that down. So. So like here's like an important result. So if you're solving AX equals B, okay, and rank of A is different from the rank of the uh, this augmented matrix. Then there's no solutions to this system. So that's like, uh, in terms of this rank thing, that's one way to describe the lack of solutions. Let me get this. Again, uh, in practice, like once you're working with something very concrete, you kind of will see right away that there were no solutions because you always will get something like this, like kind of silly, right? Like a contradiction. But like, it's just useful to say it this way because um, 
the, the other two cases happen when these two things agree, right? So the other possibility for solving a system, like this is when like there's a strict inequality. So the other possibilities must be a uh, special uh, must happen when rank of A equals the rank of the of the augmented matrix. Okay. Um, does that also imply that the nullity is zero? Well, in this case, uh, I haven't mentioned the nullity uh, because it was not needed. But what would have been the nullity in this case? It would have been, uh, well, like for A, it would have been number of columns minus the rank, right? So it was four minus two, which is two, right? And then for like the augmented one, right, would be number of columns if you wanted. Uh, minus the rank, so it's uh, pi minus three, which would be two, right? Uh, so in that case, like the nullities are both the same, but uh, the idea is like you, okay. Uh, you only have to look at the nullity to distinguish what happens when the two ranks are the same. So like once, like if the ranks are different, immediately you can say that the system has no solution. So you don't care about anything else. Uh, to distinguish the remaining two cases, you look at the nullity. And that's like where I was headed. So, um, yeah, let me write it down first. So, yeah, for example, we have done, okay. If, uh, like last time, one of the matrices we had, like one of the systems we had done with the work with was one, two, three, nine, two, negative one, one, eight, three, zero, negative one, three. Okay. And that could be reduced. So this was last time. If hopefully this is okay, if you, if you want to go back to your notes, if you reduce it, you found, we found. One zero 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 one zero 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 one two negative one three. Okay. So again, this was like our matrix A, and now this is what I'm calling R. So this is one of the systems we had considered last time. Um. But also last time we also can see, like I just want to put them together like and one next to the other so that you can compare more easily what's going on. But last time we also did uh, this one. One, one, three, five. But this was the first one we had considered. One, uh, zero, one, negative seven thirds. Negative seven thirds. Oh, sorry, what? One, one, three, five. Zero, oh, this I'm already giving you the a slightly more simplified version. It was zero, three, negative seven, negative seven, yeah. Or was it even like, no, where is the original? Oh, it was yeah, more simplified, sorry. Two, five. Negative one, 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 three, three, five. Okay. I uh, was copying a bunch of earlier versions and let's see, where do we end? Okay. And we had reached after reducing it to one, zero, 16 thirds. Maybe this one looks familiar, 22 thirds. Zero, one, negative seven thirds, negative seven thirds. Yeah. So this was our A, and this was like this is like the reduced version.
So what's the rank of A in this case for the first one? The rank of A, again, you just count the number of non-zero rows that you see here on the R. So like this is a non-zero row, this is a non-zero row, this is a non-zero row, right? So there are three non-zero rows. So the rank of A is equals, equals three, right? Okay, that makes sense. And what's the rank of the augmented one? Well, you imagine that you delete the vertical line and now you're counting the number of non-zero rows in the bigger one. But I mean, since this one already had non-zero rows everywhere, right? when you add like an extra number like that won't make the row magically become zero. So what I'm trying to say here is that the rank of continues to be three. Is that making sense of the, of the augmented one? So it, it, this is a case where there was a coincidence of the ranks, right? And if you look at um, this situation, like the rank was two, right? Because there are two no zero rows here. And uh, I mean, kind of by the same idea, logic, since there, this one already had like no zero rows, uh, once you add an extra column, like that won't change it. So the rank of the augmented one is also two. So in both of these cases, right? Uh, the rank of A equals the rank of the augmented matrix. Is that making sense? So what I'm trying to say is that uh, we still need some extra piece of data to distinguish these two, because if you just look at the ranks, you're getting like coincidence between the rank and, of A and the augmented, augmented matrix. So that's where the nullity comes in, okay? So let's try to talk uh, to see what the nullity is The nullity of A is the rank minus the number of columns of A. Or oh, sorry, number of columns minus the rank. Oops. So what's the number of columns of A? That's three. The rank is three, right? So you get three minus three, which is zero. Okay, but what's the nullity in this case? So the nullity of A in this case, again, is the uh, number of columns minus a rank, but the number of columns in this case is still three. This one still had three columns, but the, now the rank was only two, right? So you get three minus two, which is one. Is that okay? And I don't know if you remember uh, that this one had a, a unique solution, right? Like the unique solution was x equals two, y equals negative one, z equals uh, three. But this one had a infinitely many solutions, right? And if you remember when we did, did, did this example last time, all the solutions, like, like the idea was like you wrote x in terms of z and y in terms of c, right? Because a c kind of was like the free variable. So in fact, what's happening is that the number of free variables will be given by the nullity. So here, what this is saying is that there's zero free variables. Zero free variables means that every, everything is fixed. So that's a way of saying unique solution. And here, one corresponds to the fact that there was one free variable. So let me write that down because like that's kind of, kind of actually the important thing of today. So like this is okay. This is um, this is useful, but in practice, like you kind of always can see very easily if a system has no solutions. What's more interesting is like kind of how to describe unique solution versus versus infinite many solutions in, in terms of the rank of knowledge. So let me ex um, write that down explicitly. So this is like, uh, okay. Let, let me write all of, all of, all of them uh, together. So you have this system, AX equals B. So like option one is that the rank of A is different from the rank of A with B. And again, uh, this is what I wrote there. That means no solutions. 
Then you have the possibility where these two agree, right? So now you have the rank of A equals um, the rank of A together with B, the, the augmented matrix. And this one kind of bifurcates into two cases, right? So the first option, right, is in the, the nullity of A equals zero, which is uh, this possibility, and that's the one that gives you a unique solution. So here, AX equals B has a unique solution. And the other one is when, uh, let's take which color to use this. When the nullity is positive, right? It's a positive number, right? That is positive. And that means that there's like infinite many solutions and the solutions uh, depend on a number of variable of, and the number of free variables, let me write it. So there are infinitely many solutions. And the number of free variables that you get equals the nullity of A. And the number of free variables. Equals the nullity of A. So in fact, I mean, um, this one is kind of like a special case of that one, right? Because if you put like nullity equals zero, then I'm telling you there's zero free variables. So everything is fixed, right? But it kind of looks better to put them as separate cases because like having a, a unique solution is a pretty important property. Okay. Okay, it is not clear from what I'm saying right now that that cannot happen, right? But it cannot happen <laughs> because, okay, right, this is where like the course I mean, or the book kind of does things in a kind in a way that's theoretically maybe not the most useful one. The thing is, like, this corresponds to the dimension of a vector subspace. And once you so know that the dimensions can only, whatever, I mean, like I'm saying, throwing in the word dimension, which makes no sense maybe for most of you right now, but there's like, a, this actually agrees with the dimension of a subspace and the dimension of a subspace can always be non, can only be non-negative. So once you know that the nullity is a, a dimension, then, then you're good to go. But yeah, I, from what I have said so far, like you, you mean you have no reason to believe that the, Nullity couldn't be negative, but it cannot be negative. It is called the, the nullity is what is called the dimension of the kernel of, uh, of, of a matrix. Uh, the kernel uh, okay. But yeah, that's um, right. So implicitly here, like what I'm saying is that uh, which one we will justify. Maybe we will justify it later and remember if I actually, we end up proving that. But yeah, as an aside, you might, you, you might like the nullity is up. Rem Let me put it as a remark. Uh, So when the nullity is zero, it's unique solution. And when, um, I mean, uh, once you have a system of equations, and when the nullity is positive, it that gives you the number of free variables. I mean, after you know, I mean, this is like um, related to this example. 
when we had infinite solutions, I'm sorry, when there was no solution. When there's no solutions, like you don't care about what the nullity is, right? Like, so that doesn't matter. You only look at the nullity once you know, after you know that these two ranks coincide, then you care about the nullity. Why would you care about it before, right? Like, it, so it doesn't matter what the nullity would be saying in that case. Is that making sense? So again, like to summarize, you have a system of equations, you try to reduce it as much as possible, right? Make it as much as possible as the identity. And then once you get to that, you can just look at count the rank or like look at the rank basically in a direct way. And from there, like you can like identify whether there are infinite many solutions, no solutions, or like a unique solution. Okay, so um, let me just like finish today, giving you like a bunch of mini things which are useful to know. And then next time I'll tell you how to find the inverse of a matrix whenever that exists. Okay, which has, it's a little bit more, it does take a little bit more time. So, so now right, right now I'm just really going to give you a bunch of stuff. Useful things. So yeah, next let me write that down. Next time I'll tell you how to find how to determine when a matrix is invariable. Next time. How to figure out if a matrix is invariable. So for now, let me give you some other uh, useful extra facts. Um, well, imagine that you had a system of equations, right? So here's the first one. You have a... Have AX equals B, right? And A happens to be a square matrix, right? So A happens to be a square matrix, which is invertible. Somehow we know that A is invertible. We don't know yet how, but an A is a square matrix. Uh, which is invertible, right? Which we know is invertible. So here's the analog of this. If we were working with numbers, not vectors, if I give you AX equals B and all of these things are numbers, right? How do you solve for X here? Very easy question, right? What is X? B over A, right? X would be B over A. What's the analog of that? If you have AX equals B, right? The moment you know A is an, has an inverse, you can multiply both sides of the equation by the inverse. So you get A inverse, a x equals a inverse b. Does that make sense? And what happens when a, a matrix C is inverse? They just become like this, that they, they disappear, right? So you get like identity times x equals a inverse b. But the identity is kind of one, so you, you can hide it if you want. So x ends up being a inverse B. Does that make sense? And I did nothing like suspicious. Like this is the only solution we could find. So this is like actually like, a unique solution situation. Like, so there's like only one solution. And this is the unique. There are no infinite many solutions or anything of that sort because I, I just fixed for you what X is supposed to be. This is completely fixed once you know the matrix and, and B. So there's like only one solution in this case. Thank you.
That's kind of cool, right? In fact, that actually, I mean, like, I'll write that down explicitly next time, but what would it, that, what does that tell you about the nullity of an invertible matrix? It has to be zero, right? Because it always will land on this case. So we'll, I'll write that down again next time that the nullity of an invertible matrix is zero. But it's kind of nice to know that, I mean, this is one reason why we, you would like to find the matrix, like the inverse of a matrix, assuming it does exist. Because any system of linear equations is automatically solved, right? Or you just multiply the vector B by, I mean, you do A inverse times B and then you're done, okay? Does that make sense? So it's kind of like a cool thing to know. Here's another, again, uh, just to finish today. Uh, here's another interesting case. So one case which is interesting is when A is invertible. Another case which is interesting is when you choose this vector to be the vector zero. So all the constants are being set equal to zero on the right-hand side. So this is called the homogeneous case or a homogeneous system of equations. where uh, B equals a zero vector. So like what you're trying to solve now is like A X equals zero. So every coefficient or every number on the right-hand side of your system is zero. So just to make you like, make it like explicit, like as like an example of what I, that could that could look like, it could be like X plus Y minus, 3z plus w equals zero, and then 2x plus y plus 3w equals zero, and then maybe minus x plus y uh, plus z plus 5w equals zero. Like it doesn't matter like how what these coefficients look like, it just matters that I'm setting it equal to zero, equal to zero, equal to zero, right? Um, so my claim in this case is that um, If, if this is a homogeneous system, right? If you're setting it equal to zero, then you can always solve this system. There's always at least a solution. It is never inconsistent. That's what I'm trying to say. Uh, so like you should be able to provide a solution if I, uh, right? <laughs> what would it solve this system of equations? What do you think would solve this system? Just set everything equal to zero, right? Like put x equals zero, y equals zero, z equals zero, w equals zero, put all the variables set, set equal to zero. And they just get zero equals zero, zero equals zero, zero equals zero, zero equals zero, zero equals zero. That's something you can do because now uh, you don't have to worry about anything, any agreement with the right hand side because it was, it was always set equal to zero. So what, what I'm trying to say is that this one has always, this system also always has a solution. which is x equals zero. The, just plugging in the zero vector, right? Every variable being set equal to zero. So this means every variable that equal to zero. Um, And that's sometimes called the trivial solution, right? That's kind of like makes sense because like there's not much effort in figuring this one out. So you call it the trivial solution. So the question is like, well, how do you know if there are more than the trivial solution, right? Like maybe there's like an interesting combination of X's and Y's and Z's and W's that also solve this system, not just setting everything equal up to zero. And then you fall back into this case. Well, if the nullity of A is positive, then there will be infinitely many solutions and not just like the trivial case. Like sometimes it's called, like, let me put it in some parent, it's called the trivial solution for obvious reasons, right? So trivial solution. And so if um, nullity of A is positive, then there will be more, more solutions besides this one, right? Like there will be infinitely many solutions. So if 
the nullity of A is positive, uh, there will be infinite, uh, there will be other. Uh, this will not be the only solution. Let me write it down like that. This will not. So like how this would happen in an ideal world is that like first like you study this is the the the, the vectors that solve the homogeneous equation and then you would show that that forms a vector subspace whatever that means and the dimension of that subspace is called the nullity so that's how really things work out in in, in like in a again a ideal world for mathematicians it's just like uh since we're taking a more like concrete approach, it's not how we do this because we would have to talk about first like about what a vector space is, like in a dimension of a vector subspace and things like that. But at least um, this does give you like a, an idea, a better idea of like, uh, well, um, okay. So like one interesting case, again, it's invertible, infinite, uh, infinite, infinite solution. And homogeneous, where it's at least a solution, right? Uh, what's the yeah. Okay. The, it would always be infinite dimensional. Like you can never get finite any in any under any circumstances except for one, right? So it's always zero, one, or infinity. So, um, so when I say this will not be the only solution, I mean there there actually would be infinitely many. Um, So yeah, you can, and like um, on Wednesday, like once we do the review session, I'll show you, uh, there's a clever way to prove that. Uh, I haven't set, proven it, but like there's a clever way to say that a system either has zero, one or infinite solutions. I, I haven't given you like an argument for why there's zero, one or infinity. Um, but like at least, well, maybe at least for the homogeneous case, you can actually see that that works. Like, you don't have to write it because like next time, like on um, next week, I'll do this a little bit more. Like imagine that I, I found, like I'm solving this system, right? Well, if I have a solution to this system, I can, for example, I can multiply this both sides of the equation by the number three, just to give you something very concrete. So three a x equals three zero, right? But what's the number three times zero? It's just again, the, the zero vector, right? And this three, you can kind of put it like next to x. So this becomes a three x equals zero, right? So like what I'm trying to say is that the moment that you have a solution to a homogeneous system, any rescale, every any rescaling of that vector also solves the homogeneous system, right? But I could have chosen instead of three five negative one negative two pi ten thousand ten trillion. So you see what I'm saying? So for every number, I'm getting a new solution. So that tells you that there's like infinite many solutions like in the homogeneous system very easily. Um, the only thing that this requires is knowing that this was not the serial solution, right? Because if this is a serial solution, it doesn't matter what you multiply it is by, you would always get uh, the trivial solution again. So what you need, like what I'm trying to say is that this is more or less telling you that the moment you have a uh, solution besides the trivial one, there are infinitely many solutions because you just rescale it and and you would get like more solutions. But again, I'll give you a better argument next time. I mean, on Wednesday, of, once we do the review session, for why there are always infinite many solutions, not just like in the homogeneous case. Yes. This is a real problem. No, I mean, uh, uh, this is called the. Um, this is no. this is Sorry? Well, there's something that's there's something. 
uh, well, so there's something uh, which is sometimes called the general solution, which is just like describing all solutions, right? Uh, which is like one way to write it is like a particular solution plus like a solution to the homogeneous system, which I also have to mention next week. But no, in this case, what I mean by like the reason why this is being called trivial is that uh, you just said each, each variable equal to zero. So that kind of seems like very dumb thing to do. So that's why it's being called trivial. But um, like just to maybe um, I finish like, like imagine like the like if you had had like a homogeneous system, right? Um, imagine a, this is like a homogeneous system because like uh, every entry is zero, right? Like uh, on the right hand side. So what would be the solutions here? Like, well, what's the first? What's the rank? Right. So the rank is two, right, of this matrix. And the nullity, what's the nullity in this case? Yes, which is one perfect. So three minus two. So what this is saying is that we expect the solutions to depend on one variable, right, because of this nullity thing. So let's try to rewrite this more precisely. This thing that x plus b equals zero, right, and that y equals zero. Is that making sense? So this is forcing x, y to be zero no matter what. So like if you have a solution x, y, z, this is the same as x. Well, you could say that x, if you want, you can write x as negative z, right? This like this is what the first solution, like first equation allows you. So this is minus z, y has been forced to be zero, and z is still z, right? It's whatever it wants to be. So if you fact take out the, the z, you would put minus one, zero, one. Right, so what this is saying is that any solution can the form the ve this vector negative one, zero, one times a number, right? Times a free variable. So the free variable, the fact that it's one is because again, the nullity was one. And you would say that the, if you want the, the general solution is this, right? Yeah. The trivial one is like the one that you get when you put z equals zero here because it kills everything if that makes sense. Yeah. Is that it will be next Wednesday, yes. So on Monday, as I was saying, like Monday we'll be done with the material. I'll just tell you how to find the inverse of a matrix. That's the last thing we need to know. And then on Monday, I mean, or after class, I'll tell you what problems I was planning on doing for, on the review session so that you can think of them if you want before the coming to the review session, because uh, that can be more interesting than just like me seeing, seeing me write the solution. So I'll um, give you a, like a list of problems I was planning on planning to solve. Uh, what, okay. So, but yeah, like this is more like, this is what you would call like a general solution if you want to give it that name. Uh, so yeah, I'll see you uh, next week unless someone wants to come to office hours, uh, which starts.